This audio case is brought to you by Laudio. Crawford v. Washington, Supreme Court of the United States, decided March 8, 2004. Opinion. Justice Scalia delivered the opinion of the court. Petitioner Michael Crawford stabbed a man who allegedly tried to rape his wife, Sylvia. At his trial, the state played for the jury Sylvia's tape-recorded statement to the police describing the stabbing, even though he had no opportunity for cross-examination. The Washington Supreme Court upheld petitioner's conviction after determining that Sylvia's statement was reliable. The question presented is whether this procedure complied with the Sixth Amendment's guarantee that, quote, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him, end quote. 1. On August 5, 1999, Kenneth Lee was stabbed at his apartment. Police arrested Petitioner later that night. After giving Petitioner and his wife Miranda warnings, Detectives interrogated each of them twice. Petitioner eventually confessed that he and Sylvia had gone in search of Lee because he was upset over an earlier incident in which Lee had tried to rape her. The two had found Lee at his apartment, and a fight ensued in which Lee was stabbed in the torso and Petitioner's hand was cut. Petitioner gave the following account of the fight. Q. Okay. Did you ever see anything in Lee's hands? A. I think so, but I'm not positive. Q. Okay, when you think so, what do you mean by that? A. I could have swore I'd seen him going for something before, right before everything happened. He was like reaching, fiddling around down here and stuff, and I just, I don't know, I think... This is just a possibility, but I think I think he pulled something out, and I grabbed for it, and that's how I got cut, but I'm not positive. I, I, my mind goes blank when things like this happen. I mean, I just, I remember things wrong. I remember things that just doesn't, don't make sense to me later. End quote. App 155. Punctuation added. Sylvia generally corroborated Petitioner's story about the events leading up to the fight, but her account of the fight itself was arguably different, particularly with respect to whether Lee had drawn a weapon before Petitioner assaulted him. Q. Did Kenny do anything to fight back from this assault? A. Pausing. I know he reached into his pocket. Or something. I don't know what. Q. After he was stabbed? A. He saw Michael coming up. He lifted his hand, his chest open. He might have went to go strike his hand out or something and then inaudible. Q. Okay, you you gotta speak up. A. Okay, he lifted his hand over his head maybe to strike Michael's hand down or something. And then he put his hands in his, put his right hand in his right pocket, took a step back. Michael proceeded to stab him. Then his hands were like, how do you explain this? Open arms with his hands open and he fell down. And we ran, describing subject, holding hands open, palms toward assailant. Q. Okay, when he's standing there with his open hands, you're talking about Kenny, correct? A. Yeah, after, after the fact, yes. Q. Did you see anything in his hands at that point? A. Pausing. Um, um, no. End quote. Two. The state charged petitioner with assault and attempted murder. At trial, he claimed self-defense. Sylvia did not testify because of the state marital privilege, which generally bars a spouse from testifying without the other spouse's consent. In Washington, this privilege does not extend to a spouse's out-of-court statements admissible under a hearsay exception, so the state sought to introduce Sylvia's tape-recorded statements to the police as evidence that the stabbing was not in self-defense. Noting that Sylvia had admitted she led Petitioner to Lee's apartment and thus had facilitated the assault, the state invoked the hearsay exception for statements against penal interest. 
Petitioner countered that, state law notwithstanding, admitting the evidence would violate his federal constitutional right to be, quote, confronted with the witnesses against him, end quote, Amendment 6. According to our description of that right in Ohio v. Roberts, Supreme Court, 1980, it does not bar admission of an unavailable witness's statement against a criminal defendant if the statement bears, quote, adequate indica of reliability, end quote. To meet that test, evidence must either fall within a, quote, firmly rooted hearsay exception, end quote, or bear, quote, particularized guarantees of trustworthiness, end quote. The trial court here admitted the statement on the latter ground, offering several reasons why it was trustworthy. Sylvia was not shifting blame, but rather corroborating her husband's story that he acted in self-defense, or, quote, justified reprisal, end quote. She had direct knowledge as an eyewitness. She was describing recent events. And she was being questioned by a, quote, neutral, end quote, law enforcement officer. The prosecution played the tape for the jury and relied on it in closing, arguing that it was, quote, damning evidence that, quote, completely refutes petitioner's claim of self-defense, end quote. The jury convicted petitioner of assault. The Washington Court of Appeals reversed. It applied a nine-factor test to determine whether Sylvia's statement bore particularized guarantees of trustworthiness and noted several reasons why it did not. The statement contradicted one she had previously given. It was made in response to specific questions. And at one point, she admitted she had shut her eyes during the stabbing. The court considered and rejected the state's argument that Sylvia's statement was reliable because it coincided with petitioners to such a degree that the two, quote, interlocked, end quote. The court determined that, although the two statements agreed about the events leading up to the stabbing, they differed on the issue crucial to petitioner's self-defense claim. Quote, petitioner's version asserts that Lee may have had something in his hand when he stabbed him, but Sylvia's version has Lee grabbing for something only after he has been stabbed, end quote. The Washington Supreme Court reinstated the conviction, unanimously concluding that, although Sylvia's statement did not fall under a firmly rooted hearsay exception, it bore guarantees of trustworthiness. Quote, when a co-defendant's confession is virtually identical to, i.e. interlocks with, that of a defendant, it may be deemed reliable, end quote. The court explained, quote, although the court of appeals concluded that the statements were contradictory, Upon closer inspection, they appear to overlap. Both of the Crawford statements indicate that Lee was possibly grabbing for a weapon, but they are equally unsure when this event may have taken place. They are also equally unsure how Michael received the cut on his hand, leading the court to question when, if ever, Lee possessed a weapon. In this respect, they overlap. Neither Michael nor Sylvia clearly stated that Lee had a weapon in hand from which Michael was simply defending himself. And it is this omission by both that interlocks the statements and makes Sylvia's statement reliable, end quote. We granted certiorari to determine whether the state's use of Sylvia's statement violated the Confrontation Clause. Two, the Sixth Amendment's Confrontation Clause provides that, quote, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him, end quote. We have held that this bedrock procedural guarantee applies to both federal and state prosecutions. As noted above, Roberts says that an unavailable witness's out-of-court statement may be admitted so long as it has adequate indica of reliability, i.e., falls within a, quote, firmly rooted hearsay exception, end quote, or bears, quote, particularized guarantees of trustworthiness, end quote. Petitioner argues that this test strays from the original meaning of the Confrontation Clause and urges us to reconsider it. A. The Constitution's text does not alone resolve this case. One could plausibly read, quote, witnesses against end quote, a defendant, to mean those who actually testify at trial compared to those whose statements are offered at trial, or something in between. We must therefore turn to the historical background of the clause to understand its meaning. 
The right to confront one's accusers is a concept that dates back to Roman times. The founding generation's immediate source of the concept, however, was the common law. English common law has long differed from continental civil law in regard to the manner in which witnesses give testimony in criminal trials. The common law tradition is one of live testimony in court subject to adversarial testing, while the civil law condones examination in private by judicial officers. Nonetheless, England at times adopted elements of the civil law practice. Justices of the peace or other officials examined suspects and witnesses before trial. These examinations were sometimes read in court in lieu of live testimony, a practice that, quote, occasioned frequent demands by the prisoner to have his, quote, accusers, i.e. the witnesses against him, brought before him face to face, end quote. In some cases, these demands were refused. Pre-trial examinations became routine under two statutes passed during the reign of Queen Mary in the 16th century. These Marian bail and committal statutes required justices of the peace to examine suspects and witnesses in felony cases and to certify the results to the court. It is doubtful that the original purpose of the examinations was to produce evidence admissible at trial. Whatever the original purpose, however, they came to be used as evidence in some cases, resulting in an adoption of continental procedure. The most notorious instances of civil law examination occurred in the great political trials of the 16th and 17th centuries. One such was the 1603 trial of Sir Walter Raleigh for treason. Lord Cobham, Raleigh's alleged accomplice, had implicated him in an examination before the Privy Council and in a letter. At Raleigh's trial, these were read to the jury. Raleigh argued that Cobham had lied to save himself. Quote, Cobham is absolutely in the king's mercy. To excuse me cannot avail him. By accusing me, he may hope for favor. End quote. Suspecting that Cobham would recant, Raleigh demanded that the judges call him to appear, arguing that, quote, the proof of the common law is by witness and jury. Let Cobham be here. Let him speak it. Call my accuser before my face. End quote. The judges refused, and, despite Raleigh's protestations that he was being tried, quote, by the Spanish Inquisition, end quote, the jury convicted, and Raleigh was sentenced to death. One of Raleigh's trial judges later lamented that, quote, the justice of England has never been so degraded and injured as by the condemnation of Sir Walter Raleigh, end quote. Through a series of statutory and judicial reforms, English law developed a right of confrontation that limited these abuses. For example, treason statutes required witnesses to confront the accused, quote, face to face, end quote, at his arraignment. Courts, meanwhile, developed relatively strict rules of unavailability, admitting examinations only if the witness was demonstrably unable to testify in person. Several authorities also stated that a suspect's confession could be admitted only against himself and not against others he implicated. One recurring question was whether the admissibility of an unavailable witness's pre-trial examination depended on whether the defendant had had an opportunity to cross-examine him. In 1696, the Court of King's Bench answered this question in the affirmative in the widely reported misdemeanor libel case of King v. Payne. The court ruled that even though a witness was dead, his examination was not admissible, where, quote, the defendant, not being present when it was taken before the mayor, had lost the benefit of a cross-examination, end quote. The question was also debated at length during the infamous proceedings against Sir John Fenwick on a bill of attainder. Fenwick's counsel objected to admitting the examination of a witness who had been spirited away on the ground that Fenwick had had no opportunity to cross-examine. The examination was nonetheless admitted on a closely divided vote after several of those present opined that the common law rules of procedure did not apply to parliamentary attainder proceedings. One speaker even admitting that the evidence would normally be inadmissible. Fenwick was condemned, but the proceedings, quote, must have burned into the general consciousness the vital importance of the rule securing the right of cross-examination, end quote. 
Payne had settled the rule requiring a prior opportunity for cross-examination as a matter of common law. But some doubts remained over whether the Marion statutes prescribed an exception to it in felony cases. The statutes did not identify the circumstances under which examinations were admissible, and some inferred that no prior opportunity for cross-examination was required. Many who expressed this view acknowledged that it meant the statutes were in derogation of the common law. Nevertheless, by 1791, the year the Sixth Amendment was ratified, courts were applying the cross-examination rule even to examinations by justices of the peace in felony cases. When Parliament amended the statutes in 1848 to make the requirement explicit, the change merely, quote, introduced in terms, end quote, what was already afforded the defendant, quote, by the equitable construction of the law, end quote. Controversial examination practices were also used in the colonies. Early in the 18th century, for example, the Virginia Council protested against the governor for having, quote, privately issued several commissions to examine witnesses against particular men ex parte, end quote, complaining that, quote, the person accused is not admitted to be confronted with or defend himself against his defamers, end quote. A decade before the revolution, England gave jurisdiction over Stamp Act offenses to the Admiralty Courts, which followed civil law rather than common law procedures, and thus routinely took testimony by deposition or private judicial examination. Colonial representatives protested that the Act subverted their rights, quote, by extending the jurisdiction of the Courts of Admiralty beyond its ancient limits, end quote. John Adams, defending a merchant in a high-profile Admiralty case, argued, quote, Examinations of witnesses upon interrogatories are only by the civil law. Interrogatories are unknown at common law, and Englishmen and common lawyers have an aversion to them, if not an abhorrence of them. End quote. Many declarations of rights adopted around the time of the Revolution guaranteed a right of confrontation. The proposed federal constitution, however, did not. At the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention, Abraham Holmes objected to this omission precisely on the ground that it would lead to civil law practices. Quote, the mode of trial is altogether indetermined. Whether the defendant is to be allowed to confront the witnesses and have the advantage of cross-examination, we are not yet told. We shall find Congress possessed of powers enabling them to institute judicatories little less inauspicious than a certain tribunal in Spain, the Inquisition, end quote. Similarly, a prominent anti-federalist writing under the pseudonym Federal Farmer criticized the use of, quote, written evidence, end quote, while objecting to the omission of a vicinage right. Quote, Nothing can be more essential than the cross-examining of witnesses, and generally, before the triers of the fact in question, written evidence is almost useless and must be frequently taken ex parte, and but very seldom leads to the proper discovery of truth, end quote. The First Congress responded by including the Confrontation Clause in the proposal that became the Sixth Amendment. Early state decisions shed light upon the original understanding of the common law right. State v. Webb, 1794, per curiam, decided a mere three years after the adoption of the Sixth Amendment, held that depositions could be read against an accused only if they were taken in his presence. Rejecting a broader reading of the English authorities, the court held, quote, It is a rule of the common law founded on natural justice that no man shall be prejudiced by evidence which he had not the liberty to cross-examine, end quote. Similarly, in State v. Campbell, 1844, South Carolina's highest law court excluded a deposition taken by a coroner in the absence of the accused. It held, quote, if we are to decide the question by the established rules of the common law, there cannot be a dissenting voice. For, notwithstanding the death of the witness, and whatever the respectability of the court taking the depositions, the solemnity of the occasion and the weight of the testimony, such depositions are ex parte, and, therefore, utterly incompetent. End quote. The court said that one of the, quote, indispensable conditions, end quote, implicitly guaranteed by the state constitution, was that, quote, prosecutions be carried on to the conviction of the accused by witnesses confronted by him and subjected to his personal examination, end quote. 
many other decisions are to the same effect. Some early cases went so far as to hold that prior testimony was inadmissible in criminal cases even if the accused had a previous opportunity to cross-examine. Most courts rejected that view, but only after reaffirming that admissibility depended on a prior opportunity for cross-examination. History supports two inferences about the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. A. First, the principal evil at which the Confrontation Clause was directed was the civil law mode of criminal procedure, and particularly its use of ex parte examinations as evidence against the accused. It was these practices that the Crown deployed in notorious treason cases like Raleigh's, that the Marian statutes invited, that English law's assertion of a right to confrontation was meant to prohibit, and that the founding era rhetoric decried. The Sixth Amendment must be interpreted with this focus in mind. Accordingly, we once again reject the view that the Confrontation Clause applies of its own force only to in-court testimony and that its application to out-of-court statements introduced at trial depends upon, quote, the law of evidence for the time being, end quote. Leaving the regulation of out-of-court statements to the law of evidence would render the Confrontation Clause powerless to prevent even the most flagrant inquisitorial practices. Raleigh was, after all, perfectly free to confront those who read Cobham's confession in court. This focus also suggests that not all hearsay implicates the Sixth Amendment's core concerns. An offhand, overheard remark might be unreliable evidence, and thus a good candidate for exclusion under hearsay rules, but it bears little resemblance to the civil law abuses the Confrontation Clause targeted. On the other hand, Ex parte examinations might sometimes be admissible under modern hearsay rules, but the framers certainly would not have condoned them. The text of the Confrontation Clause reflects this focus. It applies to, quote, witnesses, end quote, against the accused, in other words, those who, quote, bear testimony, end quote. Testimony, in turn, is typically, quote, a solemn declaration or affirmation made for the purpose of establishing or proving some fact, end quote. An accuser who makes a formal statement to government officers bears testimony in a sense that a person who makes a casual remark to an acquaintance does not. The constitutional text, like the history underlying the common law right of confrontation, thus reflects an especially acute concern with a specific type of out-of-court statement. Various formulations of this core class of testimonial statements exist. Quote, ex parte in-court testimony or its functional equivalent, that is, material such as affidavits, custodial examinations, prior testimony that the defendant was unable to cross-examine, or similar pretrial statements that declarants would reasonably expect to be used prosecutorially. End quote. Quote, extrajudicial statements contained in formalized testimonial materials, such as affidavits, depositions, prior testimony, or confessions, end quote. Quote, statements that were made under circumstances which would lead an objective witness reasonably to believe that the statement would be available for use at a later trial, end quote. These formulations all share a common nucleus and then define the clause's coverage at various levels of abstraction around it. Regardless of the precise articulation, some statements qualify under any definition, for example, ex parte testimony at a preliminary hearing. Statements taken by police officers in the course of interrogations are also testimonial under even a narrow standard. Police interrogations bear a striking resemblance to examinations by justices of the peace in England. The statements are not sworn testimony, but the absence of oath was not dispositive. Cobham's examination was unsworn, yet Raleigh's trial has long been thought a paradigmatic confrontation violation. Under the Marian statutes, witnesses were typically put on oath, but suspects were not. Yet Hawkins and others went out of their way to caution that such unsworn confessions were not admissible against anyone but the confessor. That interrogators are police officers rather than magistrates does not change the picture either. Justices of the peace conducting examinations under the Marian statutes were not magistrates as we understand that office today, but had an essentially investigative and prosecutorial function.
England did not have a professional police force until the 19th century, so it is not surprising that other government officers performed the investigative functions now associated primarily with the police. The involvement of government officers in the production of testimonial evidence presents the same risk, whether the officers are police or justices of the peace. In sum, even if the Sixth Amendment is not solely concerned with testimonial hearsay, that is its primary object, and interrogations by law enforcement officers fall squarely within that class. The historical record also supports a second proposition, that the framers would not have allowed admission of testimonial statements of a witness who did not appear at trial unless he was unavailable to testify and the defendant had had a prior opportunity for cross-examination. The text of the Sixth Amendment does not suggest any open-ended exceptions from the confrontation requirement to be developed by the courts. Rather, the, quote, right to be confronted with the witnesses against him, quote, is most naturally read as a reference to the right of confrontation at common law, admitting only those exceptions established at the time of the founding. As the English authorities above reveal, the common law in 1791 conditioned admissibility of an absent witness's examination on unavailability and a prior opportunity to cross-examine. The Sixth Amendment therefore incorporates those limitations. The numerous early state decisions applying the same test confirm that these principles were received as part of the common law in this country. We do not read the historical sources to say that a prior opportunity to cross-examine was merely a sufficient, rather than a necessary, condition for admissibility of testimonial statements. They suggest that this requirement was dispositive, and not merely one of several ways to establish reliability. This is not to deny, as the Chief Justice notes, that, quote, there were always exceptions to the general rule of exclusion, end quote, of hearsay evidence. Several had become well established by 1791, but there is scant evidence that exceptions were invoked to admit testimonial statements against the accused in a criminal case. Most of the hearsay exceptions covered statements that by their nature were not testimonial, for example, business records or statements in furtherance of a conspiracy. We do not infer from these that the framers thought exceptions would apply even to prior testimony. Our case law has been largely consistent with these two principles. Our leading early decision, for example, involved a deceased witness's prior trial testimony. In allowing the statement to be admitted, we relied on the fact that the defendant had had, at the first trial, an adequate opportunity to confront the witness. Quote, the substance of the constitutional protection is preserved to the prisoner in the advantage he has once had of seeing the witness face to face and of subjecting him to the ordeal of a cross-examination. This, the law says, he shall under no circumstances be deprived of. End quote. Our later cases conform to Maddox's holding that prior trial or preliminary hearing testimony is admissible only if the defendant had an adequate opportunity to cross-examine. Even where the defendant had such an opportunity, we excluded the testimony where the government had not established unavailability of the witness. We similarly excluded accomplice confessions where the defendant had no opportunity to cross-examine. In contrast, we considered reliability factors beyond prior opportunity for cross-examination when the hearsay statement at issue was not testimonial. Even our recent cases in their outcomes hew closely to the traditional line. Ohio v. Roberts admitted testimony from a preliminary hearing at which the defendant had examined the witness. Lilly v. Virginia excluded testimonial statements that the defendant had had no opportunity to test by cross-examination. And Borier v. United States admitted statements made unwittingly to an FBI informant after applying a more general test that did not make prior cross-examination an indispensable requirement. Lee v. Illinois, on which the state relies, is not to the contrary. There, we rejected the state's attempt to admit an accomplice confession. The state had argued that the confession was admissible because it, quote, interlocked, end quote, with the defendants. We dealt with the argument by rejecting its premise, holding that, quote, when the discrepancies between the statements are not insignificant, the co-defendant's confession may not be admitted, end quote. 
Respondent argues that, quote, the logical inference of this statement is that when the discrepancies between the statements are insignificant, then the co-defendant's statement may be admitted, end quote. But this is merely a possible inference, not an inevitable one, and we do not draw it here. If Lee had meant authoritatively to announce an exception, previously unknown to this court's jurisprudence for interlocking confessions, it would not have done so in such an oblique manner. Our only precedent on interlocking confessions had addressed the entirely different question whether a limiting instruction cured prejudice to co-defendants from admitting a defendant's own confession against him in a joint trial. Our cases have thus remained faithful to the framers' understanding. Testimonial statements of witnesses absent from trial have been admitted only where the declarant is unavailable and only where the defendant has had a prior opportunity to cross-examine. Although the results of our decisions have generally been faithful to the original meaning of the Confrontation Clause, the same cannot be said of our rationales. Roberts conditions the admissibility of all hearsay evidence on whether it falls under a, quote, firmly rooted hearsay exception, end quote, or bears, quote, particularized guarantees of trustworthiness, end quote. This test departs from the historical principles identified above in two respects. First, it is too broad. It applies the same mode of analysis whether or not the hearsay consists of ex parte testimony. This often results in close constitutional scrutiny in cases that are far removed from the core concerns of the clause. At the same time, however, the test is too narrow. It admits statements that do consist of ex parte testimony upon a mere finding of reliability. This malleable standard often fails to protect against paradigmatic confrontation violations. Members of this court and academics have suggested that we revise our doctrine to reflect more accurately the original understanding of the clause. They offer two proposals. First, that we apply the Confrontation Clause only to testimonial statements, leaving the remainder to regulation by hearsay law, thus eliminating the overbreadth referred to above. Second, that we impose an absolute bar to statements that are testimonial, absent prior opportunity to cross-examine, thus eliminating the excessive narrowness referred to above. In white, we considered the first proposal and rejected it. Although our analysis in this case casts doubt on that holding, we need not definitively resolve whether it survives our decision today because Sylvia Crawford's statement is testimonial under any definition. This case does, however, squarely implicate the second proposal. Where testimonial statements are involved, we do not think the framers meant to leave the Sixth Amendment's protection to the vagarities of the rules of evidence, much less to amorphous notions of reliability. Certainly none of the authorities discussed above acknowledges any general reliability exception to the common law rule. Admitting statements deemed reliable by a judge is fundamentally at odds with the right of confrontation. To be sure, the clause's ultimate goal is to ensure reliability of evidence but it is a procedural rather than a substantive guarantee. It commands not that evidence be reliable, but that reliability be assessed in a particular manner by testing in the crucible of cross-examination. The clause thus reflects a judgment not only about the desirability of reliable evidence, a point on which there could be little dissent, but about how reliability can best be determined. The Roberts test allows a jury to hear evidence untested by the adversary process based on a mere judicial determination of reliability. It thus replaces the constitutionally prescribed method of asserting reliability with a wholly foreign one. In this respect, it is very different from exceptions to the Confrontation Clause that make no claim to be a surrogate means of assessing reliability. For example, the rule of forfeiture by wrongdoing, which we accept, extinguishes confrontation claims on essentially equitable grounds, it does not purport to be an alternative means of determining reliability. The Raleigh trial itself involved the very sorts of reliability determinations that Roberts authorizes. In the face of Raleigh's repeated demands for confrontation, the prosecution responded with many of the arguments a court applying Roberts might invoke today. That Cobham's statements were self-inculpatory, that they were not made in the heat of passion, and that they were not, quote, extracted from him upon any hopes or promise of pardon, end quote. 
It is not plausible that the framers' only objection to the trial was that Raleigh's judges did not properly weigh these factors before sentencing him to death. Rather, the problem was that the judges refused to allow Raleigh to confront Cobham in court, where he could cross-examine him and try to expose his accusation as a lie. Dispensing with confrontation, because testimony is obviously reliable, is akin to dispensing with jury trial, because a defendant is obviously guilty. This is not what the Sixth Amendment prescribes. The legacy of Roberts and other courts vindicates the framers' wisdom in rejecting a general reliability exception. The framework is so unpredictable that it fails to provide meaningful protection from even core confrontation violations. Reliability is an amorphous, if not entirely subjective, concept. There are countless factors bearing on whether a statement is reliable. The nine-factor balancing test applied by the Court of Appeals below is representative. Whether a statement is deemed reliable depends heavily on which factors the judge considers and how much weight he accords each of them. Some courts wind up attaching the same significance to opposite facts. For example, the Colorado Supreme Court held a statement more reliable because its inculpation of the defendant was, quote, detailed, while the Fourth Circuit found a statement more reliable because the portion implicating another was, quote, fleeting. The Virginia Court of Appeals found a statement more reliable because the witness was in custody and charged with a crime, thus making the statement more obviously against her penal interest, while the Wisconsin Court of Appeals found a statement more reliable because the witness was not in custody and not a suspect. Finally, the Colorado Supreme Court in one case found a statement more reliable because it was given, quote, immediately after the events at issue, while that same court in another case found a statement more reliable because two years had elapsed. The unpardonable vice of the Roberts test, however, is not its unpredictability, but its demonstrated capacity to admit core testimonial statements that the Confrontation Clause plainly meant to exclude despite the plurality's speculation in Lilly that it was, quote, highly unlikely that accomplice confessions implicating the accused could survive Roberts, courts continue routinely to admit them. One recent study found that, after Lilly, appellate courts admitted accomplice statements to the authorities in 25 out of 70 cases, more than one-third of the time. Courts have invoked Roberts to admit other sorts of plainly testimonial statements despite the absence of any opportunity to cross-examine. To add insult to injury, some of the courts that admit untested testimonial statements find reliability in the very factors that make the statements testimonial. As noted earlier, one court relied on the fact that the witness's statement was made to police while in custody on pending charges the theory being that this made the statement more clearly against penal interest, and thus more reliable. Other courts routinely rely on the fact that a prior statement is given under oath in judicial proceedings. That inculpating statements are given in a testimonial setting is not an antidote to the confrontation problem, but rather the trigger that makes the clause's demands most urgent. It is not enough to point out that most of the usual safeguards of the adversary process attend the statements, when the single safeguard missing is the one the Confrontation Clause demands. C. Robert's failings were on full display in the proceedings below. Sylvia Crawford made her statement while in police custody, herself a potential suspect in the case. Indeed, she had been told that whether she would be released, quote, depended on how the investigation continues, end quote. In response to often leading questions from police detectives, she implicated her husband in Lee's stabbing and at least arguably undermined his self-defense claim. Despite all this, the trial court admitted her statement, listing several reasons why it was reliable. In its opinion reversing, the Court of Appeals listed several other reasons why the statement was not reliable. Finally, the state Supreme Court relied exclusively on the interlocking character of the statement and disregarded every other factor the lower courts had considered. The case is thus a self-contained demonstration of Robert's unpredictable and inconsistent application. Each of the courts also made assumptions that cross-examination might well have undermined. The trial court, for example, stated that Sylvia Crawford's statement was reliable because she was an eyewitness with direct knowledge of the events. 
but Sylvia at one point told the police that she had, quote, shut her eyes and didn't really watch, end quote, part of the fight, and that she was, quote, in shock. The trial court also buttressed its reliability finding by claiming that Sylvia was, quote, being questioned by law enforcement, and thus the questioner is neutral to her and not someone who would be inclined to advance her interests and shade her version of the truth unfavorably toward the defendant, end quote. The framers would be astounded to learn that ex parte testimony could be admitted against a criminal defendant because it was elicited by, quote, neutral government officers. But even if the court's assessment of the officer's motives was accurate, it says nothing about Sylvia's perception of her situation. Only cross-examination could reveal that. The state Supreme Court gave dispositive weight to the interlocking nature of the two statements, that they were both ambiguous as to when and whether Lee had a weapon. The court's claim that the two statements were equally ambiguous is hard to accept. Petitioner's statement is ambiguous only in the sense that he had lingering doubts about his recollection. Quote, A. I could have swore I'd seen him going for something before, right before everything happened, but I'm not positive. End quote. Sylvia's statement, on the other hand, is truly inscrutable, since the key timing detail was simply assumed in the leading question she was asked. Q. Did Kenny do anything to fight back from this assault? End quote. Moreover, Sylvia specifically said Lee had nothing in his hands after he was stabbed, while Petitioner was not asked about that. The prosecutor obviously did not share the court's view that Sylvia's statement was ambiguous. He called it, quote, damning evidence, end quote, that, quote, completely refutes Petitioner's claim of self-defense, end quote. We have no way of knowing whether the jury agreed with the prosecutor or the court. Far from obviating the need for cross-examination, the, quote, interlocking ambiguity of the two statements made it all the more imperative that they be tested to tease out the truth. We readily concede that we could resolve this case by simply reweighing the reliability factors under Roberts and finding that Sylvia Crawford's statement falls short. But we view this as one of those rare cases in which the result below is so improbable that it reveals a fundamental failure on our part to interpret the Constitution in a way that secures its intended constraint on judicial discretion. Moreover, to reverse the Washington Supreme Court's decision after conducting our own reliability analysis would perpetuate, not avoid, what the Sixth Amendment condemns. The Constitution prescribes a procedure for determining the reliability of testimony in criminal trials, and we, no less than the state courts, lack authority to replace it with one of our own devising. We have no doubt that the courts below were acting in utmost good faith when they found reliability. The framers, however, would not have been content to indulge this assumption. They knew that judges, like other government officers, could not always be trusted to safeguard the rights of the people. The likes of the dread Lord Jeffreys were not yet too distant to memory. They were loath to leave too much discretion in judicial hands. By replacing categorical constitutional guarantees with open-ended balancing tests, we do violence to their design. Vague standards are manipulable. And while that might be a small concern in run-of-the-mill assault prosecutions like this one, the framers had an eye toward politically charged cases like Raleigh's, great state trials where the impartiality of even those at the highest levels of the judiciary might not be so clear. It is difficult to imagine Roberts providing any meaningful protection in those circumstances. Where non-testimonial hearsay is at issue, it is wholly consistent with the framers' design to afford the state's flexibility in their development of hearsay law as does Roberts, and as would an approach that exempted such statements from Confrontation Clause scrutiny altogether. Where testimonial evidence is at issue, however, the Sixth Amendment demands what the common law required, unavailability and a prior opportunity for cross-examination. We leave for another day any effort to spell out a comprehensive definition of testimonial. Whatever else the term covers, it applies at a minimum to prior testimony at a preliminary hearing, before a grand jury, or at a former trial, 
and to police interrogations. These are the modern practices with closest kinship to the abuses at which the Confrontation Clause was directed. In this case, the state admitted Sylvia's testimonial statement against Petitioner, despite the fact that he had no opportunity to cross-examine her. That alone is sufficient to make out a violation of the Sixth Amendment. Roberts notwithstanding, we decline to mine the record in search of indica of reliability. Where testimonial statements are at issue, the only indicum of reliability sufficient to satisfy constitutional demands is the one the Constitution actually prescribes, confrontation. The judgment of the Washington Supreme Court is reversed, and the case is remanded for further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion. It is so ordered. Concur. Chief Justice Rehnquist, with whom Justice O'Connor joins, concurring in the judgment. I dissent from the court's decision to overrule Ohio v. Roberts. I believe that the court's adoption of a new interpretation of the Confrontation Clause is not backed by sufficiently persuasive reasoning to overrule long-established precedent. Its decision casts a mantle of uncertainty over future criminal trials in both federal and state courts and is by no means necessary to decide the present case. The court's distinction between testimonial and non-testimonial statements, contrary to its claim, is no better rooted in history than our current doctrine. Under the common law, although the courts were far from consistent, out-of-court statements made by someone other than the accused and not taken under oath, unlike ex parte depositions or affidavits, were generally not considered substantive evidence upon which a conviction could be based. Testimonial statements such as accusatory statements to police officers, likely would have been disproved of in the 18th century, not necessarily because they resembled ex parte affidavits or depositions, as the court reasons, but more likely than not because they were not made under oath. Without an oath, one usually did not get to the second step of whether confrontation was required. Thus, while I agree that the framers were mainly concerned about sworn affidavits and depositions, it does not follow that they were similarly concerned about the court's broader category of testimonial statements. As far as I can tell, unsworn testimonial statements were treated no differently at common law than were non-testimonial statements. And it seems to me any classification of statements as testimonial, beyond that of sworn affidavits and depositions, will be somewhat arbitrary, merely a proxy for what the framers might have intended had such evidence been liberally admitted as substantive evidence like it is today. I therefore see no reason why the distinction the court draws is preferable to our precedent. Starting with Chief Justice Marshall's interpretation as a circuit judge in 1807, 16 years after the ratification of the Sixth Amendment, continuing with our cases in the late 19th century, we have never drawn a distinction between testimonial and non-testimonial statements. And for that matter, neither has any other court of which I am aware. I see little value in trading our precedent for an imprecise approximation at this late date. I am also not convinced that the Confrontation Clause categorically requires the exclusion of testimonial statements. Although many states had their own Confrontation Clauses, they were of recent vintage and were not interpreted with any regularity before 1791. State cases that recently followed the ratification of the Sixth Amendment were not uniform. The court itself cites state cases from the early 19th century that took a more stringent view of the right to confrontation than does the court, prohibiting former testimony even if the witness was subjected to cross-examination. Nor was the English law at the time of the framing entirely consistent in its treatment of testimonial evidence. Generally, ex parte affidavits and depositions were excluded, as the court notes, but even that proposition was not universal. Wigmore notes that sworn examinations of witnesses before justices of the peace in certain cases would not have been excluded until the end of the 1700s, and sworn statements of witnesses before coroners became excluded only by statute in the 1800s. With respect to unsworn testimonial statements, there is no indication that once the hearsay rule was developed, courts ever excluded these statements if they otherwise fell within a firmly rooted exception. Dying declarations are one example. Between 1700 and 1800, 
the rules regarding the admissibility of -of out-of-court statements were still being developed. There were always exceptions to the general rule of exclusion, and it is not clear to me that the framers categorically wanted to eliminate further ones. It is one thing to trace the right of confrontation back to the Roman Empire. It is quite another to conclude that such a right absolutely excludes a large category of evidence. It is an odd conclusion, indeed, to think that the framers created a cut-and-dried rule with respect to the admissibility of testimonial statements when the law during their own time was not fully settled. To find exceptions to exclusion under the clause is not to denigrate it, as the court suggests. Chief Justice Marshall stated of the Confrontation Clause, quote, I know of no principle in the preservation of which all are more concerned. I know none by undermining which life, liberty, and property might be more endangered. It is therefore incumbent on courts to be watchful of every inroad on a principle so truly important, end quote. Yet he recognized that such a rule was not absolute, acknowledging that exceptions to the exclusionary component of the hearsay rule, which he considered as an, quote, inroad, on the right to confrontation, had been introduced. Exceptions to confrontation have always been derived from the experience that some out-of-court statements are just as reliable as cross-examined in-court testimony due to the circumstances under which they were made. We have recognized, for example, that co-conspirator statements simply, quote, cannot be replicated even if the declarant testifies to the same matters in court, end quote. Because the statements are made while the declarant and the accused are partners in an illegal enterprise, the statements are unlikely to be false, and their admission, quote, actually furthers the Confrontation Clause's very mission, which is to, quote, advance the accuracy of the truth-determining process in criminal trials, end quote. Similar reasons justify the introduction of spontaneous declarations, statements made in the course of procuring medical services, dying declarations, and countless other hearsay exceptions. That a statement might be testimonial does nothing to undermine the wisdom of one of these exceptions. Indeed, cross-examination is a tool used to flesh out the truth, not an empty procedure. Quote, In a given instance, cross-examination may be superfluous. It may be sufficiently clear in that instance that the statement offered is free enough from the risk of inaccuracy and untrustworthiness so that the test of cross-examination would be a work of supererogation. End quote. In such a case, as we noted over 100 years ago, quote, The law in its wisdom declares that the rights of the public shall not be wholly sacrificed in order that an incidental benefit may be preserved to the accused, end quote. By creating an immutable category of excluded evidence, the court adds little to a trial's truth-finding function and ignores this long-standing guidance. In choosing the path it does, The court, of course, overrules Ohio v. Roberts, a case decided nearly a quarter of a century ago. Stare decisis is not an inexorable command in the area of constitutional law, but by and large, it, quote, is the preferred course because it promotes the even-handed, predictable, and consistent development of legal principles, fosters reliance on judicial decisions, and contributes to the actual and perceived integrity of the judicial process, end quote and in making this appraisal, doubt that the new rule is indeed the right one should surely be weighed in the balance. Though there are no vested interests involved, unresolved questions for the future of everyday criminal trials throughout the country surely counsel the same sort of caution. The court grandly declares that, quote, we leave for another day any effort to spell out a comprehensive definition of testimonial, end quote but the thousands of federal prosecutors and the tens of thousands of state prosecutors need answers as to what beyond the specific kinds of testimony the court lists is covered by the new rule. They need them now, not months or years from now. Rules of criminal evidence are applied every day in courts throughout the country, and parties should not be left in the dark in this manner. To its credit, the court's analysis of testimony excludes at least some hearsay exceptions, such as business records and official records, 
to hold otherwise would require numerous additional witnesses without any apparent gain in the truth-seeking process. Likewise, to the court's credit, is its implicit recognition that the mistaken application of its new rule by courts, which guess wrong as to the scope of the rule, is subject to harmless error analysis. But these are palliatives to what I believe is a mistaken change of course. It is a change of course not in the least necessary to reverse the judgment of the Supreme Court of Washington in this case. The result the court reaches follows inexorably from Roberts and its progeny, without any need for overruling that line of cases. In Idaho v. Wright, 1990, we held that an out-of-court statement was not admissible simply because the truthfulness of that statement was corroborated by other evidence at trial. As the court notes, the Supreme Court of Washington gave decisive weight to the, quote, interlocking nature of the two statements, end quote. No re-weighing of the, quote, reliability factors, which is hypothesized by the court, is required to reverse the judgment here. A citation to Idaho v. Wright would suffice. For the reasons stated, I believe that this would be a far preferable course for the court to take here. For more audio cases, visit us at laudioforlisteners.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel.